way inside. Find a seat. Close one if you can. As we're making our way to our seats, I want to welcome you to the District 30 Humorous Speech Contest 2014. I'm your Sergeant at Arms. I'm welcoming you and I'm so happy that you're able to be here this evening. We are going to have a wonderful contest. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you things that you all ready But I still have to say them. So please take your phone, turn it off, silence it, put it on vibrate, whatever you need to do. Make sure that it won't make noise as we listen to our speakers tonight. I'd like to introduce our contest, excuse me, our conference Toastmaster, distinguished Toastmaster, and I'm looking around for her, distinguished Toastmaster, Linda Enningenberg. Thank you, and kudos for Elizabeth for doing a great job and for pronouncing my name correctly. You get a prize for doing that. Laughter. We just, I just says it's the best medicine. So let's prepare for an injection. Who's ready for a humorous speech contest? Yeah! That's kind of energy we want. Before we do that, we are going to have a drawing. Is it going to be Mike Lee? Outstanding. Our past Chester Governor, Mike Lee, is going to call a number. And is this your first time up on the district stage? Uh, no. For <laughs> <laughs> the uh, select distinguished red carpet work for my club, so second time. Last time, last time. Give me hand. Who's doing our third poll? Who's doing our third poll? Oh, Gina, Gina Cotts. The next thing we have to raffle off was donated by our past district governor, Ms. Joan Moore. And it has the name Vince Lombardi on it. Yeah! Yeah! Look how beautiful. Yeah. Get those raffle tickets out! Got it? Six, 
Toastmasters and club number and name. Sorry, new Toastmasters. I don't know my number by heart. But I am Cleo Scott. I belong to Windy City, Westminster. <coughs> Speaking of success and Westminster's club. Okay, thank you, Press. I appreciate that. Actually, when you belong to that many clubs, you get a pass. You don't have to know the numbers. Are we ready to roll? Who's ready for a humorous contest? Bringing up our contest Toastmaster. Have you ever wanted to be the contest master? No. Do you feel like you could be a stronger leader? Are you looking for a new challenge in your life? If you answered yes, think about becoming involved as a district leader. Our contest chair today has served as North 42 Area Governor, President, and VP of Education and Club Mentor. Earned her Distinguished Toastmaster designation in October of 2013. Chaired contests at the club area division and now district levels. She ran a successful advertising business for over 20 years. Now she's taken her talents and skills to help people <clears throat> with change in their lives. She's a professional manager. Manages day-to-day -day activities of her daughter. Manages the household. Manages to work out daily. That's an accomplishment. Speaker, coach, and writer, please welcome to the stage your contest Toastmaster, Stephanie Karakawa. Let's first recognize 
our interests. And we will start with our district governor, Donna Weston. Our lieutenant governor of education and training, Ethel Goldie. Our lieutenant governor of marketing, Melissa Newport. Our public relations officer, Cassandra Griffin. Our secretary, Linda Riggs. Our treasurer, Helen McCall. Our Sergeant at Arms, Elizabeth Stevenson. Our Parliamentarian, Bob Roman. Our immediate past District Governor, Michelle Cable. Our Administrative Chair, Don Williams. Our Recognition Chair, Sharon Cruz. <laughs> Friends, the contest today will provide us with a learning environment to learn that magic of humor. So please, take a moment and turn off all cell phones, pagers, any device that makes <laughs> noise. <laughs> Give our contestants that good environment to perform. And please, no flash photos during the presentations. With that said, we have to go over the protocol. Contestants, timers, power counters, judges, and surgeon at arms have all been briefed. Everyone is aware of the Toastmasters international rules that govern this contest. No one should enter or leave the room during the presentations. You may do so if time permits during the one minute of silence between the contestants. At the end, after the last contestant, please do not leave the room, but remain seated and silent until it is determined that all ballots have been collected. And with that said, let the contest begin! Here is the speaking order for the humorous speech contest. Contestant number one, Daniel Ekstrom. Daniel Ekstrom, contestant number one. Contestant number two, Eric Fennendale. Eric Fennendale, contestant number two. Contestant number three, Hong Ming Liu. Hong Ming Liu, contestant number three. Contestant number four, Mandy Sha. Mandy Sha, contestant number four. Contestant number six, contestant number five, Bad O'Donnell. Bad Ordono, contestant number five. Contestant number six, Bruce Hooker. Bruce Hooker, contestant number six. Contestant number seven, Garrett Gray. Garrett Gray, contestant number seven. And contestant number eight, Barry Mix. Barry Mixon, contestant number eight. We will proceed with the humorous speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timers, 
When I advise you to do so, please give me a signal when that minute of silence is up. After our last contestant, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their parts. We will now begin the humorous speech contest. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Contestant number one, Daniel Ekstrom, a born butthead. <laughs> there is a squatter in the womb. A born butthead. There is a squatter in the womb. Daniel Ekstrom. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests. Yes, it's true. I was born a butthead. And I'll explain that to you in a little bit. And I'll bet you a lot of you are standing there thinking, sitting there thinking, this guy looks like a butthead. I won't argue the point. Am I coming through? Is my No. No. Am I coming through? Yes. Okay, thank you. Because if I move, anyway. I was born a bucket, it's true. And some of you are thinking, of course you were, we can see that. <laughs> but here's what happened. It's not all my fault. It really isn't. You see, I was born a breech bird. That means when I was born, this is the first part of me that the world saw. And you know what that means? That means that my moon first thing of me that saw the sun. <laughs> it's true. Let me explain. For months I was hanging out with my mom. We were getting along great. She would take me here, take me there. Everything was good. We got into a little bit of a disagreement, and the disagreement was this. I thought it was my womb. She thought it was her womb. <laughs> so what happened? I'd been in there for a while, and I was comfortable. Nobody told me that I would be leaving. Nobody told me that I had a time limit that I would be getting out of there. Nobody told me how I was supposed to get out of there. Nobody told me that I had some responsibility to help myself get out. <laughs> Unlike all of you, because I'm sure that there are no other breach births in this audience, you all were born this way. They said, dive, Bernard, dive, and you did. Just like this. And you were out, and you were born. You immediately went to college and got your MBA. And <laughs> Not me. Mine was much, much rougher. You see, I wasn't so much born as I was evicted. <laughs> see, my mom didn't tell me that I had to leave at a certain point. So I just was settling in for the long haul. I put some pictures on the wall. <laughs> Everything was coming along nicely. And then all of a sudden, things started to change. And I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't know why. She thought I was a squatter. She thought that I was living rent free. <laughs> I thought I owned the place. They gave it to me. I didn't see anybody else around. Why would I think that I was going to be leaving? <coughs> I was a different kind of a squatter. I was this kind of a squatter. I was like a catcher. And I was in there, and yeah, as I, time went along, it got a little more crowded, and I was, but I had a lot of time to think. I was learning things. We were, we were comfortable. <coughs> Everything was good. I was in. My comfort zone. As they say. <laughs> you hear a lot of talk about John C. Maxwell and Tony Robbins, and they all tell you, get out of your comfort zones. Grow, be big. I'm here to tell you, they're lying to you while they're taking your money. <laughs> Leaving your comfort zone can be a very dangerous thing, and I'm living proof, and I'll tell you why. Here's what happened. One day I heard a voice, and the voice said, Gene, that's my mom. I think it's time. And I'm hearing this and I'm thinking, who is that guy? <laughs> what is it? And what's well, time anyway? It was kind of deep. And so I didn't.
didn't like his tone. He was very smug, he was very arrogant. He says, Gene, I'll meet you at the hospital in a few days, okay? She says, okay. And I waited, and all of a sudden, a few days later, we're at the hospital. And he says, okay, Gene, lay down here. She does. And she, he says, okay, when, Gene, when I say breathe, you breathe. When I say push, you push. So she starts breathing and pushing and breathing and pushing. Well, I'm inside and I'm still in my catcher position like this, okay, because I'd gotten a little bigger. And all of a sudden, I feel some trembling going on and I'm feeling the earth kind of moving under my feet like this. And all of a sudden, the walls are starting to cave in and I'm like, what's happening here? I don't like this. I'm not comfortable anymore. <laughs> And it gets worse, and it's worse, and it's worse, and it's worse, and oh my God, I'm getting thrown on to a somersault. I don't know what's happening. And I'm scared out of my mind. And I decide to fight back. <laughs> They're not gonna take me. That was Sir Reebok. So whenever he says, push, Gene, push, I said, pull, Dan, pull. <laughs> so I'm like, this way, and I'm coming back this way. We fought for 25 hours. <laughs> That part is true because I remember all of this. <laughs> Except maybe for a few parts that I don't remember. But it's all true, most of it. <laughs> so for 25 hours, this went on. Finally, he says, Gene, I think we're making some progress here. He says, I'm going to take a look. So he comes down like this. He starts looking inside, and he says, he can't figure it out because this is such a rare event. He doesn't know what's happening either. He looks in, he goes, Gene? Ooh. He says, your kid's smile is great. But his breath is terrible. She goes, really? Take another look. Hey, I don't, what are you talking about? He gets in there, and he goes like this. And he goes, Oh my gosh, usually I see some hair on a head or something. She goes, he goes, but you know what? She says, what? What does he look like? Your son looks like an asshole. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Anyway, five more hours go by. I come out. I'm out. A few seconds. They bring my dad. He's been in the hallway for 30 minutes. Back and forth. There was a rut in the hall, hallway floor. They hand him the scissors. He's like, he cuts my umbilical cord. I'm thinking, oh my God, they tried to kill me in there. Now they're going to kill me out here. They're going to starve me and they're going to suffocate me to death. And I had no more fight left in me. So I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when they tell you to get out of your comfort zone, stay right where you are because it's really, really dangerous out there. Thank you. Thank you. Contestant number two, Eric Feyenbaker. Boredom Buster. Boredom Buster, Eric Feyenbaker.
was exactly 16 minutes and 17 seconds into my family's annual summer vacation. And I was in full relaxation of the guy. I had my flip-flops on, baggy pants, icy cold beverage in one hand, cheers everyone, and a colder one in the other. Cheers everyone. <laughs> And there wasn't a Toastmasters meeting for a hundred miles. <laughs> My family and I, we were sprawled out doing absolutely nothing. On a rustic deck of a rented beach house, overlooking a lake, the backwoods of LaVale, Wisconsin. Population, 291 town folk, six or seven cows, and an orphan skunk named Lenny. <laughs> It was the perfect vacation getaway for my three radiant children, my long-suffering beautiful bride, and every single last one of her side of the family. <laughs> Why do you think I had two beverages? <laughs> I looked down at my four-year-old son, Ben, my favorite tax deduction. <laughs> I said, isn't this great? He gazed back. And he blurted out three of the most frightening words that I have heard since, honey, I'm pregnant. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, Danny, I'm bored. <laughs> Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Now, you know in the movie Titanic, where they see the iceberg and they sense something bad is about to happen? <laughs> Kind of like when the Bears play the Packers. <laughs> <laughs> or any team this season for that matter. <laughs> well, when I hear the words, Dad, I'm bored, I sense something bad is about to happen. Now, parents, can you relate to what I'm talking about? Yeah. Because I had flashbacks to the last time I heard the words. Dad, I'm bored. Travel with me. Back in time. To a dark room inside Fort Finadig. In it, it our house cat Mr. Jingles and bored Ben. Now Ben was not only armed with a cynical grin, but also glow in the dark, edible finger paints. Gluten free, of course. Skip ahead six minutes, seventeen seconds, and I hereby issue a personal challenge to each and every one of you. Just scrub clean a furious hissing feline with both sets of claws that have just been painting over every color of the rainbow and to not fear the words, I'm bored! But back to the story. And showing up just in time, like a pizza delivery man at a frat party, was my brother in law, Maniac Matt. Who, by the way, has earned a CC designation for competent, crazy man. <laughs> And he pulled up in his fishing boat named the Crappie Catcher, leaned over and yelled out, Who y'all wants to do some fishing? It was the perfect boredom buster. I was in. Ben, are you in? I'm in. Count me in, Dad. Great. Maniac Matt, are you in? I'm in. Ben's in. I'm in too. Perfect. Lady the Skunk, are you in? I'm in. Ben's in. Maniac Matt's in. Are you in too? Lady the Skunk was not in. And thank goodness. So it was just the three of us. Myself, Maniac, Matt, and Ben. We all headed out to the deepest part of the lake. Now when we got there, we each cast out our fishing lines. And we waited, and waited, and waited. We waited so long, I began to think it was even less exciting than having to go to Toast, Toastmaster's officer's training. <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> At 9 a.m. on a Saturday. Now, because we waited so long, we had floated back to the middle of the lake. I said, Matt, you better fire up that engine. We were met with the sound of click, click, click. Turns out the battery, it was as dead as my professional bodybuilding career. <laughs> How you doing? How are you? Anybody else want some of this? <laughs> so we tried it again. Click, click, click. Yep. It was as lifeless as a Cubs World Series victory party. 
then I really got worried. I said, Matt, give him one more crack. Click, click, click. Yep, that guy already was as dead as Blagojevich's political career. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, and hold me out here, the trip, it was both a blessing and a curse. You must have had a similar vacation. <laughs> because one of us was going to have to swim ashore to get help. The question was, who is it going to be? Maniac Matt or me? It was time for a staring contest. I looked at Matt. Matt looked at me. Neither one of us going to blink. Don't blink. Finally, Ben said, well, Dad, you jump. It's Uncle Matt's boat. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was sold out by my own son. My flesh and blood. The fruit of my loins. <laughs> Looks like I'll be splitting the will only two ways. <laughs> As I was swimming away from the boat, Maniac Matt, he had about six or seven Budweiser's in him, and all you hear behind me was him holding that Jaws thing. <laughs> Donna. Donna, 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 Donna. Well, eventually I made it back to shore without getting eaten. Jumped in a kayak with a couple extra oars and headed back to the boat. Maniac Mag and I, we then took turns rowing that crappie catcher back to land. As we got closer to shore, the rest of the family had gathered and they were woohoo, clapping and cheering as Captain Ben stirred us to safety. And who else was there to greet us? None other than a skunk named Lenny. <laughs> And I gave him a cold one. <laughs> Needless to say, it wasn't the perfect vacation. But the next time one of my kids comes to me and says, Dad, I'm bored, I have the perfect boredom buster response. Want to go for a boat ride? <laughs> Master Toastmaster. <laughs> Contestant number three, Hong Ming Liu. What's your limit? What's your limit, Hong Ming Liu? If you have been to the Harold Washington Library in downtown Chicago, clap your hand. Dog. It's too dark to read. <laughs> On the third floor, there's a boat from 
Oprah Winfrey. Getting my library card was like citizenship. It was like American citizenship. Really? <laughs> I wait 10 years <laughs> to get the eligibility to apply. I find this comparison disproportionate. <laughs> Every time I go by that quote, this is what goes through my mind. O'Hare Airport, custom inspection. When this beefy, intimidating immigration officer asked for my travel paper, Timothy, I present my library card. <laughs> He cannot believe his eyes. <laughs> what? This is a Chicago Public Library card. You must be one of us. <laughs> Welcome home. Come right in. I'm like, holy Tony and Oprah is right. <laughs> I start to walk like Bruce Lee. <laughs> The officer is chasing me, yelling, stop him, stop him. I freeze like a pin at the bowling leg. And the officer is a giant bowling ball rolling towards me. Bowling ball run like a donut. I'm crushed. He grabs my car, pushed my face. Look, you almost threw me. Look, your car has expired. trying to ridicule Oprah here. <laughs> but I think it's an example to show, as empathetic as she can be, she has a limit. <laughs> By limit, I mean something obstruct your view. Like a wall prevent you from seeing other people's perspective. And it's my mission today to ask you this question. What's your limit? But first, let me tell you mine. It was the first week of my coming to America. I was a 20-something kid, just come from China. I was so excited. I was coming to date. Somebody on the street at a bus station asked me, how long have you been here? I had the ready answer. Five days? Ten days? Twenty days? They hit me. The guy at the bus station was asking me how long I have been waiting for the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I took 20 days. <laughs> no wonder he looks surprised. <laughs> but the strange part is, after knowing I wait for 20 days, this guy started to wait. Patient. <laughs> Then of course he would do that. He's a cops thing. Oh. <laughs> but let's forget about it. It's about me. me. Too much of me. It shows how much I can be wrapped up in my own perspective. That was my limit. Recognizing it allows me to step on my limit and look around me in fresh eyes. French writer Marcel Proust said, the adventure of life is not to discover new landscape. The adventure of life is to look at the old one with new eyes. And I think the best way to do it is to step up on your limit. And I guarantee you, We'll see something <coughs> new. And I feel right now, I'm stepping up on a soapbox, and I can pontificate on and on. <laughs> but I have to leave. I, I really have to get my library card renewed. <laughs> 
but I will leave you with this message. I hope when you drive home tonight, this question cross your mind. What's your limit? This is the whole Contestant number four, Mandy Shah. Chicken. Chicken. Mandy Shah. Just one syllable. Don't 
you want to meet on your dinner menu that is powerful, <coughs> yet sexy, <laughs> and affordable? Your answer is chicken. Chicken. Chicken also has very serious anthropological implications in the contemporary American society, especially here in District 30. <laughs> As an immigrant, my first cultural shock had to do with chicken. In many Asian countries, dark meat is light because it's considered flavorful and juicy. So imagine my shock when I went shopping at Jewel for the first time and saw that chicken breast cost more than $4 a pound. And drumsticks were so cheap that another shopper told me that she was buying it just for her son can practice juggling. <laughs> I've been stewing over that very traumatic moment <laughs> for a very long time. Is white really better than white <laughs> Look at McDonald's. Since they started advertising its chicken nuggets as all white meat, <laughs> sale has jumped. 35%. What should we do about this battle between dark and white meat? It has been eating away at me. So I finally did what any sensible postmaster would do. I googled. <laughs> Turns out that it's mostly advertising. And I'm going to let you in. On a little secret. You know those frozen white meat hamburger patties that we buy with grill marks on them? Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's how they are made. <laughs> Manufacturers put a lot of water and a lot of dark meat into a high speed blending process. <laughs> and they suck all the water and fan up. the meat and put grill marks on them. Voila! Why are you looking? <laughs> Postmasters. Chicken has always been there for you. As not what chicken can do for you. But what you can do for chicken. So when you go to tonight's conference dinner, <laughs> look beyond one syllable meat and reach for chicken. Don't be hating dark meat. Choose chicken. Love chicken. And eat more chicken! <laughs>
Contestant number five, Beth O'Donnell. Picture perfect. Picture perfect, Beth O'Donnell. Like, 
spilt milk. Help me! I have an idea. Let's take their clothes off and snap some pictures of them that way. What? <laughs> he wants me to take off their matching sailor suits? <laughs> the ones I spent 51 weeks shopping for? <laughs> Naked pictures? Well, I guess it is their birthday. <laughs> With no other solution in sight, off come their clothes. Gone, gone with the whoopee, out with the pacifier, while the photographer clicks picture after picture. After what seems like just five seconds, he says, that's a wrap. You left proof to the week. What? That's it? We're done? But, but, oh, where's that bottle? Oh, oh. The kids and I make it safely home. I'm emotionally exhausted, <clears throat> and I'm physically sore. It feels like labor pains, again? How can two one-year-olds run me ragged? <clears throat> I'm a working mom. I own my own business. Twice as nice, uh, more like double trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever gotten more than you bargained for? Be content with what life gives you. If a picture is worth a thousand words, <clears throat> what can I say about this one in a million photograph? To me, this is picture perfect. <clears throat> <laughs>
sleep out there. <laughs> but the best part about cheerful tearful was when you pulled out her arm, she went from being cheerful to tearful. <laughs> she let out a little crying noise. <laughs> what more could a boy ask for? <laughs> In a doll. <laughs> and fortunately for me, it was December of 1967. And I was becoming aware of a man, a powerful man, who might be able to bring me Miss Cheerful Tearful. The man's name was Santa. <laughs> oh, certainly Santa knew I had been a good little boy. So bring me cheerful terror. Oh, but there were dark forces working against me. <laughs> Behind my back, another man, a powerful man, even more powerful than Santa Claus, would seek to deny my wishes. <laughs> the man's name was Paul, but I knew him better. Daddy. <laughs> Daddy was a Midwestern man, like most Midwestern daddies in the 60s. He was not all that keen on getting his little boy a dolly <laughs> for Christmas. Now, I wasn't privy to the conversation that took place between my mother and my father regarding this cheerful tearful. But I always imagined it went something. <laughs> no son of mine is going to get a doll for Christmas. <laughs> but dear, that's all he wants. That's all he's asking for. <laughs> I should tell you, my father may have been a born and bred Midwesterner, but my mother grew up outside of New York City. And she would kill me if she heard to do that impersonation. <laughs> What's so doggone special about this dolly, anyway? Well, Dee, it's got blonde hair and blue eyes, just like your son. And the best part about the doll, when you pull it on, it makes a little crying noise. <laughs> I don't know if it was something that last little bit of information my mother told my father <laughs> that put the light bulb over his head. Maybe this was his train of thought. Hmm. Maybe I'm all turned around on this doll idea. I thought if the other kids saw my son playing with the doll, they would think he's a sissy. Maybe make fun of him. Beat him up. But if they see him playing, Dollars twisted <laughs> and pulling on the doll's arm until it cries. <laughs> they won't think it's a sissy. They'll think he's psycho. <laughs> Be afraid of him. Maybe get beat up less. I still think I should give him something more macho for. Christmas morning, 1967. I go down to the tree. There's a package for little boy Bruce. And I open it up. A Red Rider BB gun? <laughs> I didn't ask for a Red Rider BB gun. I shit my eye out. <laughs> Fortunately, my mother was there. Can you give me that? Here you go, Bruce. Another package. In this package, cheerful, tearful, oh, and I was the happiest boy in the world. Now, over the years, Miss Cheerful, Tearful, and I, we've grown apart, <laughs> gone our separate ways, but thank you to the power of the internet and to eBay. We have a very special guest here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Miss Cheerful Tearful.
folks here, well, I think our time is almost up here tonight. You want to wave goodbye to the nice dog? <laughs> All right, you're done waving. Put your arm down. Here, let Daddy help you put your arm down. <laughs> Mr. Contract. Sure. Contestant number seven, Garrett Gray. Garrett and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad Monday. Garrett and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad Monday. Garrett Gray. These two cops were so inept, 
They made Barney Fife look like Clint Eastwood. Their <laughs> <laughs> names? Officers Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> I thought the service must be the time. They stormed into the building, secured it, and ordered me back in to identify the missing items. As I walked in, <coughs> Officer Bailey was pointing to the papers everywhere. And he said, Man, they really ransacked this place. <laughs> it looked the same to me. <laughs> I identified the missing items. Five laptops, four printers, and two Dr. Peppers. <laughs> hey, in or out of the office, I won't tolerate a pop thief. <laughs> the morning personnel trickled. Officer Bailey asked, Mr. Gray, do you have any disgruntled employees? I said, yeah, all of them. <laughs> and then I bashed my boss to such a control. Officer Bailey listened to my title. And then he said, Mr. Gray, <clears throat> where were you last night? And do you drink Dr. Pepper? What did I tell you? Inept! So Officer Bailey here makes me go outside in the cold to pop the trunk of my car. He took one look inside and he said, Man, and I thought your office was messy. <laughs> I was fishing all day, Officer. He then proceeded to rummage through my fishing my fishing waders, and my fishing tackle to finally fish out a can of Dr. Pepper. Now that's fish. <laughs> he then told me not to. Because he went to run my place. He even took my can of Dr. Pepper with him. He called it evidence. <laughs> Five long minutes later, Officer Bailey exited his squad car and calmly walked back to me. And then he said to turn around, put my hands behind my back. As I tried to explain, you're arresting the wrong guy. He said, Mr. Gray, our traffic cameras caught you running five red lines. <laughs> 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 Officer Bailey and he slapped on those cuffs faster than a Kardashian can say I do. <laughs> I was busted. They dragged me back to the police station like a common criminal. There they find me, multiple fines, and held me on suspicion of theft. Dad insult to injury. They threw me into a holding cell for 20 hours with this tattooed behemoth named Tiny. <laughs> it turns out Tiny and I weren't so different after all. I was nabbed for possession of Dr. Pepper. He was nabbed for possession of Coke. <laughs> Luckily, they caught the real thief and let me go. I paid my fines. They returned my car from impound, and as I jumped in behind that wheel, I realized I'm in another hot mess. You see, they had held me for almost 24 hours didn't give me many one lousy phone call. I had to hurry back and explain to my boss, not Mr. Wright, my wife. <laughs> so as I pulled onto that pavement, I pulled up to a red light. I looked at my watch. <laughs> I'll wait. I'm just here. A minute of silence, please.
Contestant number eight, Barry Mixon. It's hard to be a superhero. It's hard to be a superhero. Barry Mixon. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and distinguished guests, I love superhero movies. I always have. Batman, Superman, Aquaman, even the Hulk. And when I was a kid, I wanted to be all of them. But as I got older, I realized something. Isn't it strange that none of the superheroes are married? I pondered that question for a long time. But after a few relationships, including the one I'm in right now, I finally figured out why. Imagine that you're Superman, the Man of Steel. On Monday, you save a Japanese fishing village from a tsunami. On Wednesday, you put the cat on a nuclear reactor, saving New York City. On Friday, you literally catch a 747 that's mere inches from total destruction. And now here on a Saturday, all you want to do is watch the game. <laughs> Maybe have a beer. Your wife, Mrs. Superman, has other ideas. Oh, honey, you know what I was thinking? Why don't we take the forest, not the tree, but the forest that's in the front of the house and move it all the way to the back of the house? <laughs> don't you think that would be fun? <laughs> ba babe, you know the game is coming on, right? Oh, sweetie, I know, but it only will take us a few minutes. And if Superman is crazy enough to tell his wife no, that's when he's going to flip the script and say, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake, my bad. I thought you were Superman. <laughs> I guess that S don't really mean anything. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have discovered that it is hard to be a superhero. See, when you're faster than a speeding bullet, that means you go to the store all the time. <laughs> when you're more powerful than a locomotive, that means anything that's heavy that needs to be moved, the bed, the refrigerator, the couch, heck, the whole house, you do it. <laughs> Gentlemen, when you can leap tall buildings in a single bound, that means that you can never, ever tell your woman a decent reason for not putting down the toilet seat, <laughs> for not taking out the garbage for not picking up your clothes when you come home. My God, man, you're a superhero. That kind of thing should be easy for you. <laughs> it's hard to be a superhero, especially when you're Aquaman and your woman has hair issues, because that means you never go to the water. Not with her. You can fuss all you want to. Honey, when are you going to visit my parents? Do they still live in the ocean? Yes, then never. <laughs> Batman will never be married. In fact, he won't even have a steady girlfriend because there's no woman on the face of this earth that will ever allow her man to hang out all night long. Especially when he's a billionaire, driving a cold car, have a black muscle suit with gadgets. In fact, Batman knows he doesn't even want the stress of a relationship because he knows the moment that he walks in the house, the first thing his woman's going to say is, where you been all night? <laughs> and if Batman is crazy enough to try to explain, that's when she's going to say, oh, you want me to believe that it took you all night long to stop the bank robbery, right? Mm. See, you don't understand. It's hard to be a superhero. Especially when your woman is this tall and she doesn't give a flying beaver doobie about your powers. <laughs> Here's Dr. Bruce Banner having an argument with his wife. The argument gets a little bit heated. He feels his blood pressure start to raise. She keeps talking and he keeps getting angry. After a while, he feels himself changing until the anger takes over and he turns into the Incredible Hulk. Her response. Oh, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Don't even think about taking that green toe with me. See, because nobody's impressed because you 
want to get all swole up. <laughs> you felt the need to rip out of? I bought that. With my money. See, that was my mistake, but I married you. I thought you understood, buddy, when I realized that you were green. <laughs> and ladies, ladies, I didn't forget about you. Oh no, I saved you for last. Because it's even harder for you. Because you're Wonder Woman. Walking around with six inch stiletto boots, boy shorts, body banging, hair done, makeup laid, and your nails are done. Newsflash, your man expects that every day. <laughs> He's not gonna be impressed because you woke up early in the morning, made breakfast, took the kids to school, went out there and fought the forces of evil, flew your invisible jet home in traffic, picked up the laundry, made dinner, put the kids to bed, and now you think all you're gonna do is take a nice hot bath and go to bed? Oh, no, no, no! Your man is not having any of that because the moment you step into the room with those funny bunny slippers on, the first thing your man is gonna say is, man, you gonna wear that outfit I got you last night? Because you're for your man, it's not enough that you're a superhero. No, he expects you to be a superhero and this November. <laughs> so, the next time you find yourself fantasizing about being a superhero, stop and think. Think about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife. Think about all the crazy things that they ask you to do now. And then just imagine what it would be like if you were a superhero. Because I'm here to tell you from personal experience, it's hard. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's a Thank you, sir.
now let's get to know our contestants. Contestants, please join me on stage for a brief interview. in this country is just very hard on everyone. So I'm hoping to set the record straight. <laughs> That's great. Mandy, thank you very much for participating. <laughs> Beth O'Donnell, how long have you been in Toastmasters? Well, those adorable babies are now 17 years old. I have some of my life back. I've been doing this for two and a half years. All right. Which 
Club are you representing today? I'm from Glen Ellen Club, Town Criers, 1743. What's your highest Toastmasters in educational level? I'm a CC and three projects away from my CL. Wow. So, well, a few months ago, I saw an article in the Toastmasters magazine about you and your mentor, Corey May. You were smiling, you were picture perfect. <laughs> and I wonder, why is it important to have a mentor? I was found pushed into Toastmasters <laughs> because a friend of mine suggested that it would help me find a new job, improve my communication skills, and most importantly, gain confidence as I change jobs. Without having someone to show me the way and to tell me all the details, details that go into preparing a speech, I wouldn't have given it the dedication or the time that is needed to advance. So a mentor is, is greatly, greatly appreciated. I'm actually the VP of E in my club and I'm head of our mentor role. And it's something I really feel strongly about. Excellent, Beth. Thank you so much for your Bruce Cooker, how long have you been in Toastmasters? For us, I've been in Toastmasters a little over five years. So, which club are you representing? I am representing the big and mighty Toastmasters of Lincoln Park. Advanced Communicator Bronze, Advanced Leader Bronze. So, now that you and Cheerful Tier 4 are reunited, <laughs> what's your wish for this coming Christmas? <laughs> A long trip someplace very, very warm. <laughs> Excellent, Bruce, thank you so much for your participation. Very great. How long have you been in Toastmasters? Two years. Which club are you representing? I'm representing Windy Sea Professional Speakers Toastmasters. What's your highest education level? ACB and a CL. Now you are a constant competitor, and I know that your boss is in the audience, <laughs> and I don't mean Mr. Wright. How has your wife, Mandy, helped you in your family? Well, she's in law school now, so she'll tell me when I'm practicing too much, can you be quiet? I'm trying to study here, and I try to honor her wishes. But, but truly, Mandy has been a great support for me. She's the most encouraging and supportive wife a guy could ever ask for. So I love you, honey. So, Barry Mixon, how long have you been in Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters for five years, 11 months, and 15 days, and six hours. Now, which club are you representing? Christ Universal Temple Club number three, number 666595. What's your fans Toastmasters dedication? I am proud to call myself a distinguished Toastmaster. You're a storyteller. Yes, sir. Is it hard to be a storyteller? <laughs> Not as hard as being a superhero. <laughs> or being a teacher in the Chicago public school system. That's when you really use your superpowers all the time. Excellent. And what's the most rewarding part of teaching? After getting the kids to sit down for more than five minutes, <laughs> when the kid really, when the child really understands it comes back to you, especially when they said that they hated science, I teach science, and they come back and say, I really get this, Mr. Mixon, that would be like, finally. The fact that it took nine months to do it doesn't really matter, but they finally get it. Well, excellent, Barry. Thank you so much for your participation. Great job.
gentlemen, the awards to be announced at dinner. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. With that said, the contest is adjourned. moments you've been waiting for. Who wants to hear who won the humorous speech contest? And do I have the envelope, please, for the winners? There we go. And I would like to have Ethel and Melissa help me handle these awards. You got me all. I got you good. You got me good. <laughs> <laughs>